to Great Loop Radio, brought to you by America's Great Loop Cruisers Association. We're dedicated to sharing Great Loop information and inspiration with those actively cruising, planning for, or dreaming about a Great Loop adventure. I'm Kim Russo. I'm the director of AGLCA. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome back Sarah Bolin. Sarah is also known on social media as Mom with a Map. She's been with us before. And the topic today is going to be handling the fact that the Canadian border, the Canadian U.S. border may still be closed as members approach there this year. Um, so we're going to talk specifically about experiences with the, the Welland Canal. Um, and I'll give a little bit of background. So before I really kind of jump in, I want to take a moment as usual to recognize and thank our Admiral sponsors who support AGLCA at the highest level. They are Curtis Stokes and Associates, Passage Maker Trawler Fest, Skipper Bob Publications, and Waterway Guide Media. As always, we encourage our listeners to support these businesses that support the Great Loop. So back to the topic at hand, I'd like to welcome uh, Sarah Bolin, Mom with a Map. Sarah, thanks for joining me again today. Thanks for having me, Cam. Yeah, and before we jump in, I just want to give a little bit of background because this is a very fluid situation like so much things related to COVID are, but there, there is some background that I think we need to provide. Um, as most of us know, the U.S.-Canadian border has been closed uh, since last year. There is no certainty as to when it will reopen. There's lots of um, tourism interests that are really pushing for that to happen, but ultimately that decision is going to be made obviously very high up in the U.S. and Canadian government. Um, sadly, pretty well beyond our, our control as much as we would like to be able to influence and impact that decision. You know, we're in contact with our contacts in Canada, um, and even they are telling us, you know, that the power to do that is way beyond us. Um, so we're cautiously optimistic and hopeful that the U.S.-Canadian border will open to boat traffic at some point in 2021. When that will be, we just don't know. Again, cautiously optimistic that it may be in time for U.S. boats to cross into Canada at the typical looper time frame, which would be kind of the June-July time frame. Um, but of course, at this point, that's right around the corner. Um, so the option if you cannot do that, uh, if you can get under a 15 and a half foot bridge, you would take the full length of the Erie Canal into Lake Erie. You're staying completely in the U.S. and you can continue your loop adventure that way. If you can't clear that bridge, your other option is to take the Erie Canal to the Oswego Canal, which is a very typical looper route. But once you uh, take the Oswego Canal, which puts you out into Lake Ontario, instead of going across the lake, into Canada and starting the Trent Severin, you're going to head west on Lake Erie towards the Welland Canal. And that's the canal. I'm sorry, I just said that very confusing. <laughs> Let me back up. You're going to come out the Oswego into Lake Ontario. Typically, loopers would cross Lake Ontario and head for the Trent Severin waterway. Instead, you are going to turn west on Lake Ontario towards the Welland Canal. The Welland Canal connects Lake Ontario to Lake Erie and then you'll be able to continue your journey. The issue is the Welland Canal is in Canada. And in a typical year, you can transit the Welland without truly checking into Canada. Um, really the rules say that if you are touching ground in Canada, so to speak, if you're anchoring or tying up in Canada, then you have to check in. Um, typically it's a little bit of a different process with the Welland because you are just transiting through. Last year, the procedure went into place with the border closure that U.S. citizens were not allowed to enter the Welland Canal on their boats. So looper boats had to hire a captain. The captain would take the boat through and the U.S. citizen loopers would meet the boat on the other side. That's what happened last year. And that was after a lot of confusion because there are obviously many levels in the Canadian government who have some sort of interest in this process. Um, and there was a lot of confusion because those contacts don't always agree, those different agencies and the different levels within the agency. So again, remember it's a fluid situation. Everything with COVID is, we are monitoring this. We are looking for changes. The best we can do at this point is explain to you what we know today and we brought Sarah in because she and her family did this aboard their boat last year. So she's kind of got that firsthand experience of what we expect today is still the process. It could change. We are monitoring it. We know there are sources out there right now that are finding different information. And I think we can explain a little bit 
why that information differs and why we are being a little bit cautious on that. So with that very long winded introduction to the topic out of the way, I wanna officially bring in Sarah. Um, and, and Sarah, you've been with us before, but kind of fill us in on your great loop so far and what you've been up to since we last saw you. Yeah, so for those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm traveling the Great Loop with my family. I've got two kids and we picked up a puppy about halfway through. Um, we're aboard a Cruisers 4450 uh, and we started out of Brunswick, Georgia in June of 2020 and so have been traveling ever since and uh, we're very close to crossing our wake. We're kind of avoiding it at this point because we really don't want to consider ourselves done. Um, we're looking forward to hanging the Goldbergie, but right now we're just taking advantage of a very warm and wonderful Southwest Florida winter. <laughs> yes, very good place to be right about now. It's finally starting to warm up here in Charleston, but uh, I would certainly pick F Fort Myers <laughs> for the winter is a great place to be. And I know you're there with lots of other loopers and just having a blast with that. Um, so you and I probably actually spoke for the first time last year. Um, you were one of those intrepid boats who uh, kind of handled all of the obstacles that 2020 was throwing your way and, you know, waiting for the Erie Canal to open well into August. Um, so we first um, kind of started to talk because you were one of the, the members getting kind of the same information we were getting um, from the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway Authority, the management corporation that manages the Welland Canal. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you were hearing from them. Yeah, so as we were uh, kind of waiting it all out, really the Erie Canal was our first obstacle, you know, waiting for that to open. And so we were exploring, at that point, we were not that nervous that Canada was not going to let us at least transition through. Um, there's a right of innocent passage rule that states that as long as you don't stop, anchor, tie up or whatever, that you should be allowed to transition through. And so we were very hopeful um, initially that Canada wasn't the issue um, at all. And so didn't do a ton of research um, until it was happening live. And I think that's uh, one of the reasons that Kim and I both are, are wanting to help others uh, just kind of get to know a little bit about what may happen just in case that does, you know, can happen um, that they aren't allowed to transition through. Yeah, so um, uh, an obvious place to start when you're looking for information about the Welland is the um, St. Lawrence Seaway Great Lakes Management Corporation that manages the Welland. Um, and they did, and um, I was hoping that a lot of the confusion would be cleared up by this time, but it seems to remain that if you contact the, the management company for the Welland Canal, they are telling you that it's kind of business as usual, that since you are just transiting through, you're allowed to come on and go through. The problem is while they manage the canal, it is actually the Customs and Border Services Agency that gets to make the decision about whether or not you can enter Canada to go through the canal. Um, and as I said, in a normal year, it's, it's not truly considered entering Canada, but you do go through the CBSA. And with the border closure, the agents there on the ground at the Welland, our information up to and including today are not allowing U.S. boats to go through because the border remains closed. Um, the way to get around that is to hire a commercial captain. That essentially makes it a commercial transit. In addition to that, you know, that's kind of what we've been talking about, you know, it being a commercial transit. Um, yesterday, I spoke to one of our members. Um, he's kind of my boots on the ground source, so to speak. Um, he serves as a crew member. When you are going from in the direction from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie on the well, and you actually need three people aboard. Uh, so this member actually serves as that third person, both for owners and for professional captains. So he sees it from both sides of the equation. Um, he is local to there, uh, sees the canal every day. And as of you know, my discussion with him yesterday, they were still requiring that hired captain. Um, ultimately, Covert or not, the ultimate decision on whether or not you can enter Canada or probably any other country is really up to that border services agent that you're dealing with there. So even if you're calling CBSA um, and you're speaking to someone who answers the phone and they're perhaps in Ottawa or perhaps Toronto, um, they may tell you what 
they have in front of them as how it works, but ultimately it's up to those people at the well end. And that's our concern um, is that people are being given um, by very well-meaning, good-hearted uh, government officials are being given information that when they actually arrive at the well and turns out to be misinformation. Um, we are cautiously optimistic that this will change and it'll be a little bit back to business as normal at the well end but we just don't know and we don't want our members to arrive at the Welland and be caught off guard by this requirement. So to the best of our knowledge, boots on the ground, um, you know, I've seen the documentation that the captains, uh, and I just was made privy to this yesterday, that the captains have to submit. Um, and it's not just that it's a commercial transit. The other thing they're actually allowing to happen is a repositioning of a boat um, to the other end or to the other side of the border. And this falls under that, you know, special guidance, so to speak, um, for this very unusual pandemic circumstance. So we just want members to be prepared. And because I'm sure a lot of people are going, interesting, what do I do? You know, how does this work? How do I turn my boat over to a captain? So that's what Sarah is gonna share with us really from her experience. So um, tell us how you did, you know, you found out this is what you were gonna have to do um, after being given that kind of same standard information that it wasn't needed, um, but you finally did kind of realize, yes, you had to do this. So how did you find a captain there at the well and to take your boat through? Yeah, so Kim, at the point that I conceded that I was not going to be able to take my boat through Canada, um, we contacted a couple of the AGLCA sponsor captains. And unfortunately, because I wanted this to happen like the next day, um, they were on a, a much longer timeline. It was more of like a three to four weeks. Again, the advantage of planning now is that you can kind of think through those things. But we ended up uh, contacting a harbor host in the Buffalo area who connected us with a captain. Um, to my knowledge, we were his first loop boat that went through, uh, but he had done a couple other repositionings of vessels. And so he had um, gone through the well and several times uh, as the, the commercial captain transiting boats. Um, and so that's how we connected with him. Yeah. And, and I appreciate the shout out to AGLCA sponsors because we do have delivery captains who are sponsors and we always like to support them. None of them are local to that area. Um, and the interesting thing about the Welland is a one day transit. It's a long day. It's typically about 10 hours, I think. Um, uh, so it, it may not be cost effective for members to pay the travel costs for a sponsor captain to get there for a one day trip through the Welland. That said, if there are many of you planning that, let me know, let's get you together because perhaps you know there's a way to split the, the travel costs for the sponsor to get there. The thing to keep in mind, as I said, it's a one day transit and the way that, that canal works is they go in one direction one day and then back the other way the next day. So it's, it's kind of like an every two day kind of thing that a captain can take a boat in the direction loopers wanna go for one captain. Um, but you know, again, one of the, the benefits of AGLCA is if there are several of you planning this, let us know. We can group you together and see if we can work something out that's going to make this the most efficient um, and, you know, hopefully support our sponsors at the same time. If that's not possible, we certainly understand that too. So there are resources like Sarah found to find a captain. Harbor hosts are a great resource. The forum is a great resource. If you need a captain to do this for you, posting there will probably get you some answers from folks who did it last year or members who are local and, and know of somebody. So keep that in mind as well. Um, so there's been some talk in the forum, Sarah, about, you know, what makes this a hired captain, you know, could per se to um, people with a captain's license who happen to be loopers switch boats. Um, I don't really know the answer to that. What did you find, you know, and I know you weren't the person who approached the border <laughs> because you weren't allowed, but do you know what uh, paperwork the captain had to submit to prove this was a repositioning or a commercial transit? Uh, yes. Hang on. My computer just, okay, there we go. Um, yes, I do. We had the captain actually sent us all the paperwork that we needed. So we were able to just fill out the form and he was the one who was completely working with the border on all of the things that we needed to have lined up. Um, so he sent us the paperwork signing off that it was a commercial transaction. We went ahead and, and sent him the money ahead of time. I mean, all the things that made it an official commercial transaction, um, I will say, thinking creatively, we were with a buddy boat, and it was my crazy idea that we were going to crew on each other's boats. Um, and we did actually call customs and ask if that would be okay. And they said if it was not something that we did on a regular basis, that they would highly discourage it. 
And so um, after really thinking about it and praying about it, we decided that this was just too big of a risk to take. We wanted to just do our loop, get through Canada. Um, so in terms of people who don't do it on a regular basis or switching boats, crewing on each other's boats, um, I'm not going to say that it, it's totally wrong and that you, you wouldn't get away with it or you wouldn't be able to do it. But um, the answer I got was that it was pretty frowned upon. So we wanted to make it 100% by the books and just kind of follow the rules, get our boats through and keep on looping um, was kind of our motto. So. Sounds, sounds a lot more stress-free to me to know that it's, it's all taken care of. All taken care of. Um, and I think, you know, uh, people think of hiring a captain and, and expect a pretty expensive undertaking. And it is, but it is for a single day. So share with us a little bit about the cost that you experienced. So we, uh, the captain himself was $400. He brought both crew members with him and we paid each of those crew members $200. This was set completely by the captain. Again, I didn't have to, there was no negotiating, debating. That was the cost of it. And that's what we paid. So $800 total for the captain and two crew members. Okay. Um, you know, which, which is a big amount of money if it's not something you planned for in the scope of the whole loop, probably not hugely significant. Um, and it's certainly, if that's what you need to do to let you continue. Um, you know, it, it is what it is, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Um, at least it's not in, you know, in the several thousand dollar range. So it's nice to hear that it's, it's pretty much a standard rate and not something where there's, you know, people trying to take advantage of the situation that loopers and other boaters are in. Um, so kind of tell us how that day worked. You know, it's, it's a one day transit and you're turning over your boat and you're not allowed to go with it. So kind of walk us through the day and how it went. Yeah, so for our details, um, first of all, the paperwork all had to be submitted 48 hours in advance. And so we knew 48 hours in advance that our captain was approved for the specific day we had requested. So that gave us a little bit of wiggle room in terms of getting our boat to Youngstown, New York, which is on the Niagara River. Um, and that is where our captain requested. I think that's a very standard jumping point. It is a stone's throw away from Canada. And so you're right there. Um, he requested that we remove all of our alcohol. If we had tobacco products or firearms, um, he wanted all of that off just to not even have to deal with any of that. Um, so we took care of that and, uh, he asked us to meet him at 6 AM. So of course we spent the night, the night before, um, on a wall right there. And, and where was that arrived. that you were meeting him, Sarah, just so we're clear? What was yeah, the, the meeting point? It's called Youngstown, New York on the Niagara River. Okay. Sorry, um, you did mention that. Again, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so, and if he, uh, it, I mean, other captains would be different. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so he showed up at 6 a.m. The arrangement that we had worked out was that we were taking his car and he was taking our boat. So that was fantastic for us because it gave us transportation for the day. Um, so we took his car 6 a.m. Uh, we had done the engine checks the night before we had uh, I had gone ahead and placed all the fenders on our boat so that he didn't have to worry about that. Um, and just the general things and securing the cabin things that I would have been doing anyways if we were taking our boat. Um, we had taken care of all of that. Um, so he took our boat at 6 a.m. It was a little strange to just see our boat floating off and uh, us not on it. But uh, for us, we chose to go to a hotel for the day. Um, I mentioned in the other podcast we've recorded, my husband's working full time on the loop and my kids are doing homeschool and just to have kind of a home base for the day. That's what worked for us. So we got a hotel that was walking distance from the marina um, in Buffalo that our captain was going to be delivering our boat. So, yeah, and it's, it's, you know, something that I hadn't thought of till we talked is that, you know, the captain obviously needs a way to, to get home after he gets to the other side. So it makes total sense that, and uh, very nice that he was able to give you his car, but that also was a benefit to him because then it was waiting for him when he arrived at the other side too. So um, exactly. are there things to see and do in the area for people who maybe, you know, want to take advantage of that time by land and, and maybe not don't have as much work in, in school to do it as your family does? Absolutely. Uh, you are right uh, at Niagara Falls. So again, staying on the U.S. side of Niagara Falls would be a wonderful day activity. Um, we actually found Buffalo to be a really neat city, uh, lots of stuff to walk around, great food. Um, so we enjoyed doing some of that uh, after we had finished doing school, the kids and I. 
Okay. And if, if I'm remembering correctly, it's usually about a 10 hour transit on the Welland. Um, there were some issues that caused your boat to be uh, without you aboard for a little bit longer. Tell us, tell us how that went down. Yeah, so our captain had told us, again, he had taken some other boats through that were just wanting to reposition. And he had said he was back to Buffalo by about 6 p.m. every other time. Um, ours was more like 1 a.m. So we're very thankful that we had the hotel room. Um, I put the kids to bed and Brent was the one who actually met uh, our captain at the marina. But it just kind of was what it was. I mean, I think anybody who boats knows that days don't always go expect as as expected. Um, and he got stuck behind a bridge that had gotten stuck in some kind of windstorm. So it was kind of a fluke accident, um, may or may not happen again, but you just always have to be prepared. So probably good to have stuff um, off your boat that you might need if, if it did go into the night. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, just kind of to wrap up this portion, it, beyond the fact that the captain was required, it sounds like it was kind of a peace of mind and the process doesn't sound like it was as challenging as one might think because the, the captain handled, you know, where to meet him, where he was going to meet you on the other side and the paperwork. So, um, you know, other than the delay, it sounds like it wasn't a crazy ordeal for you. <laughs> no, it, uh, I, in my head, I built it up and I think partly because there was nobody to talk to that had done this before. Mm -hmm. And so I built it up in my head that it was just going to be this really difficult thing. I talked to you about all these crazy outside the box ideas, you know, could we weigh our boat down a whole foot to try to get it through the Erie? I mean, I just made it so complicated. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it, it really, it was an easy day. It was a, it was kind of a nice day. It was a little break from boat our Ourselves. And mm -hmm. we were able to watch our boat on the uh, marine traffic app, which was kind of neat to see your boat moving through the, uh, the canal. So it, it, yeah, it, at the end of the day, it worked out really well. And it was a nice transition. Wonderful. Great advice. Um, we're going to take a quick moment and play a message from one of our sponsors. When we come back, um, we're going to just touch on some of the places that you visited along Lake Erie, because that's a, a lake that lots of loopers don't get the opportunity to do. And there's been a lot of chatter on the forum about um, the great ports along the way. So we'll take the break and we'll be back in a moment. Did you know that every mile of the Great Loop is covered by Skipper Bob guides? It's mile by mile format is a great planning tool and essential at the helm. On the most popular routes and side trips, Skipper Bob covers preparation, navigation, bridges and locks, and the best places to visit. Skipper Bob guides are updated each year, and its website keeps you current with navigation alerts and cruising news. To check it out, go to skipperbob.net. Skipper Bob is a proud Admiral sponsor of AGLCA. We're back on Great Loop Radio. My guest today is Sarah Bolin. You may know her from social media as Mom with a Map. And Sarah's been filling us in on her experiences with her family um, aboard and, and not aboard <laughs> their boat last year as it went through the Welland Canal. So we're kind of filling you in on what loopers may experience this year if the Canadian border is still closed, uh, both to Canadians and to U.S. citizens wanting to cross either way. Um, we are hopeful that the border will open in time for the U.S. boats to cross in in the, the June-July timeframe. If it starts to get much later than that, it becomes a challenge for them to make it all the way through the Great Lakes and into the inland rivers before before the um, cold weather sets in. Um, probably more likely that it may be open in time for our Canadian members to be able to cross into the US on um, Lake Huron and Lake Michigan because that's typically later in the summer. So of course we're monitoring all that. Um, you know, that's another one of those things that anybody that we have access to in Canada just kind of says that's way above my pay grade. We don't know when it'll open, um, but we know we are not the only ones pushing for that. And there are lots of um, tourism interests on both sides of the border that are really hoping we can get the border opened up. And thankfully, we're seeing some numbers drop on COVID. So we are cautiously optimistic that progress may be made there. But in the meantime, if you are not lucky enough to go to Canada this year, you are still very lucky to continue your loop because Lake Erie has some great cruising grounds. So Sarah and her family, after finishing with the Welland Canal last year, had their boat in Lake Erie. And Sarah, kind of tell us of, um, you know, some of the ports of call that you visited and what were some of your favorite things along that less traveled route? Yeah, so we do feel very fortunate that we had the opportunity to cruise that lake. 
Um, again, we've heard from a lot of loopers that Canada is one of the highlights, and I get that. And we're very hopeful that we get to go back someday with a boat. Um, but just kind of glass half full, we really, really enjoyed Lake Erie. Um, there's so many different little towns along the way, charming places. Um, we stopped in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is uh, a state that's not always visited on the loop. Um, so we really enjoyed getting a chance to be there. The whole town is very walkable from the waterfront. Uh, lots of great food, uh, just neat things to do there. So we really enjoyed Erie. Um, from there, we went on to Cleveland, which is on the water. Um, probably not one that would have been on my bucket visit list if we hadn't boated there, but um, we were just really thrilled with how neat the city was. Um, just enjoyed being there. Um, Sandusky, Ohio is a true highlight. I think my kids will say that was one of their favorite stops on the whole loop. We really um, thought that the whole town was charming. There's a lot of history there in addition to the, uh, the big amusement park that's there. Um, so that was a neat thing. And then from there, you're really heading up towards Detroit. You're crossing up uh, Lake Erie. I think most people would cut off that last little part of the lake and uh, head up towards uh, Lake Huron. Yeah, and, and we got some questions recently from um, loopers who were planning that route and were a little bit concerned about crossing into Canadian waters as they were cruising through there. Um, no problem with that as, as far as your information had, Sarah, correct? We did not have a problem. We talked to two different captains in the Sandusky area, just kind of looking at the route that we would need to take. And as we were watching it on our uh, Navionics and everything, um, you're never stopping. It's you're right there on the border where the water, you know, but there's there's no visible line of where Canada, <laughs> is, you know, you don't see that on the water. And so we just kind of did our best to hug the U.S. side and transition through. Um, I think it's the St. Clair River, maybe mm -hmm. um, yes. in that area. And um, and yeah, through Detroit and everything. And then we actually stopped in Algonac, uh, which is the home of Chris Craft. And so my husband was, you know, being obsessed with boats. That was a really cool thing for him. So we enjoyed uh, enjoyed being there before heading up to Mackinac. Yeah. So really, um, lots to see and do along Lake Erie. We're going to be providing some more content for the members that are headed that way that kind of talks about some of the things to see and do. Um, so, you know, while perhaps some disappointment for some about not being able to visit Canada, <laughs> if that remains, um, uh, you know, I, I think overall, you'll still have a great a great, great loop experience um, if Lake Erie is, is your way to go this year. So Sarah, any other thoughts that might help loopers who are kind of struggling? You know, uh, folks are kind of at that point where if they're in Florida, it's starting to be time to head north. Um, and some people are questioning whether they want to do that if they don't know if the Canadian border is open. So any advice that you have to for loopers who may be struggling with that decision? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just kind of share personally kind of the uh, thought process that went through our head. Um, because it is, it's a tough decision. I mean, most people wait um, for years to loot and it's a big deal and you want to kind of do it right. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, when we were faced with the decision of, of transitioning our boat through Canada, wait another year, waiting another two years, um, just know that time isn't guaranteed, you know, dreaming in our case, kids get older and um, you know, they may not want to live on a boat with mom and dad. That may not be the cool thing to do forever. <laughs> um, so we we really just wanted to kind of face what we could when we could and uh, and just look forward to maybe one day getting back to Canada, um, do a platinum loop. I mean, all the things are, are things that we're hopeful to do in the future, but it was just important for us to kind of continue. We were all in this year and as you've known, that's quite a few things, but um, I think that hanging the gold burgie will be all the sweeter when we get to do it because it hasn't been uh, hasn't fun. Yeah, we're having a little bit of your, you're breaking up just a little bit. I think it's an internet issue, um, but, but we got most of that. Um, and one of the points that you made, Sarah, which I think is a really great point um, is it's a, a really good reason to, to go around again if that suits you. And um, if Canada is super important to you and going around a full loop again is not in the cards for you, 
Canada's actually, and someone pointed this out to me the other day, and I hadn't really thought about it, but Canada is actually one of the places on the loop that is most available via renting a boat or chartering a boat in the different canals. They have them on the Trent Severn, they have them on the Rideau. Um, so that may be an opportunity as well if that was a place you really wanted to explore. And if the border's not open in time, there are some other options. So um, that would get you to experience both Lake Erie and the parts of Lake Huron that a lot of loopers don't do as well as Canada. So I think we'll leave it at that for today. But Sarah Bolin, mom with a map, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your experiences from 2020. And um, again, we're hopeful that it may become a little bit more simple in 2021. Perhaps the border will open. Perhaps they will not require that captain. But to the best of our knowledge, as of now, um, your experience will be very similar to Sarah's. So, so Sarah, thanks for sharing that information so others can be prepared. Absolutely. And if, if there's any questions I miss out or any information that anyone wants to know, I am super happy to do kind of a one-off conversation, answer any questions or, or anything. I'm happy to to do that and walk you through because we didn't have that last year. And so I really um, know how valuable that is just to kind of have somebody to hold your hand and walk you through it. So that, that's happy to do that. <laughs> very generous. Sarah, what's the best way for people to reach you? Um, Sarah at mom with a map or I'm at mom with a map on Facebook and uh, Instagram. So either okay. way, easy to get a hold of me and I'm happy to answer those questions. Excellent. Sarah, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And to our listeners and viewers, thank you for joining us once again on Great Loop Radio. We'll be back next week. Until then, safe cruising. Mm -hmm.